Running isn't a battle of the sexes, and there are some unique differences between female and male runners. So if you are a mother runner out there who wants to tap into your strength and manage the unique challenges you may face as a female runner, then this is the episode for you. Welcome to episode 156 on the Healthy Runner Podcast, where we help you get stronger, run faster, and enjoy lifelong injury-free running happy last podcast episode of 2022 and we are finishing with a true expert who is passionate about supporting women and girls to discover the best in themselves and fulfill their potential today's guest is dr M dr emma ross who until recently was the head of physiology at the english institute of sport uh, supporting practitioners working across Olympic and Paralympic sports and leading the EIS Female Athlete Program. This program aimed to empower coaches, athletes, and sport practitioners to better understand the exercising female, how to capitalize and cope with her physiology and psychology in the context of sport. Dr. Emma recently co-founded the Well HQ to continue this mission to tackle the taboos, educate and empower people in sport and beyond about topics such as periods and the menstrual cycle, breast health, pelvic floor health, and what it takes for girls and women to thrive in sport, in health and in life through education and um, consulting in to schools, sports federations, and businesses, the Well HQ is redesigning sport for women, whether they want to enjoy participating or train to perform at the highest level. Dr. Emma, thank you so much for being willing to share your expertise and come on the show today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, guys, this is going to be an exciting episode where Dr. Emma is really going to educate us all about the differences between women and men and what you need to know to either help your own running or to support your spouse, your daughters, or your moms, right? We're going to talk about the training adaptations, recovery, injury risk, menstrual cycles, menopause, and how we can support our adolescent girls starting out in sport. So Dr. Emma, on the show, we always start with a little dynamic warm up like we would before our runs. Um, so can you share um, with our listeners, you know, where you call home and give us a little bit more backstory on how you've gotten to this point in your career journey? OK, so uh, I feel very fortunate to live in a in a it's kind of the countryside of the south of England. Um, and we are nestled between the South Downs, which are those kind of chalky white cliffs that you see on those um, you know, postcards from England. We live between the, the, the South Downs, which has amazing trail running, and the Ashdown Forest, which is where A.A. A. Milne and Winnie the Pooh live. So um, we are <laughs> surrounded by some amazing countryside. Um, and I guess that's uh, where I like to go and um, kind of decompress. Uh, and so feel very fortunate to, yeah, to, live, to live here. And I'm only about three miles from where I grew up. So it's also nice to be surrounded by communities that that I've known for a long time. Very nice. And, you know, how, how did you, and I guess from, you know, what I've been gathering and following some of your content, you've started out more as a researcher, is that correct? Yeah. So my journey started, I mean, I, I followed, I stayed at university for way too long. I, I did a, a sports science degree and then I did a master's in sports science and then I did a PhD studying exercise physiology so kind of honing um in on physiology specifically um and after that I stayed and I was an academic so I taught and I researched at, at universities um for about 10 years and at the time I was um kind of really interested in human performance and the limits of human performance and how um our bodies change when they were trying to perform in extreme environments so very hot environments very cold um high altitude so low oxygen and and that's that's kind of what my work comprised of and then um um just after the 2012 olympics which was here in london um and sort of British sport was on a high uh, and I was asked to go and head up the sports science team at the English Institute of Sport which was a, an amazing opportunity because they are the science and medicine arm of the Olympic and Paralympic system so here I was entering the Olympic and Paralympic world when it was on kind of an all-time high and also a brilliant challenge because 
you know, walking into that environment, the question is, how do we stay here? How do we stay? And how do we be the first country who, you know, uh, beats their medal tally in the games after their home games, which no one had done before? Um, And we were able to do that in Rio. And I worked um, in the Olympic and Paralympic system for um, two Olympiads. You know, we lived our life by Olympiads. So I worked um, to build up and prepare for the Rio Games and then towards the Tokyo Games, which was meant to be in 2020 and happened slightly later than we anticipated. Um, and as part of that role, I was helping all of the sports in our in our high performance system think about how to optimize performance. And I was working with sports scientists, particularly the physiology team, who were looking at you know pushing the boundaries um, of sports science getting the basics right but then also thinking about what's you know what's new what's cutting edge in terms of supporting not just performance but the health and well-being of athletes so they can perform really well and then after the Rio games we um, were having the usual kind of debrief you know what went well what didn't go well what do we need to concentrate for uh, Tokyo and from a physiology perspective there was definitely an environmental factor Tokyo was a hugely hot humid Olympics so that their sort of heat load was um the greatest it was ever have going to be. So as a physiologist, we all got excited because we we got to think about how to prepare athletes to compete in the heat and particularly those type of endurance sports that, you know, that was a really exciting challenge. But the other question we asked, and and I was specifically in charge of of really sort of um, pushing forward this uh, theme of work was, do we support our female athletes well enough? Um, And when we looked at the, the medal data from Rio, we saw that our female athletes were actually bringing home less percentage of the medal haul than other countries so like in the states your female athletes do brilliantly they bring home half the medals sometimes even 55 percent of your medals in uh team gb at the time in the olympic squad we were getting 35 percent of our medals from female athletes so that started a conversation which uh and a question really why did that happen which was very hard to answer because you can imagine that the the reasons why that happens are rooted right down into grassroots sport, right through the whole pyramid of performance. And so whilst we didn't ever really have an ambition to answer the question, what it allowed us to do was just ask us what I think was a better question was, do we support our female athletes well enough? And I, for the first six months of that project, I just went out and asked that question to coaches and to the athletes themselves and to the nutritionists and strength and conditioning coaches and I kind of just said, do you feel like you support your female athletes really well? And the first the first answer is always yes. You know, we're a world class system. We are, you know, we are at the, at the cutting edge of, of science and coaching. And of course, we do brilliantly. And then I sort of started to say, oh, so that's great. Um, you know, what is it that you do that's specific to her being female that kind of makes your support of her really optimal? And everyone was slightly less <laughs> forthcoming with, the, you know, like, oh, uh, and I, you know, do you consider the menstrual cycle or um, do you have we focused on design of sport, uh, breast support as much as we have focused on the design of, um, you know, the, the race suits? And everyone was very quiet then because they actually, you know, they hadn't considered it and almost worse still, we weren't talking about it. And so um we then were able to develop a strategy, which was first, we have to raise the awareness, then we have to educate and say, you know, these are the things that we should be thinking about when we're supporting women in sport and female athletes and their health, their well being and their performance. And then we were at the same time doing some innovation work and research work around sort of pushing the boundaries. But really, the aim was to improve the whole system in terms of just just accepting that that we needed to do something differently. Um, so I did that for for about six years, that project, and it, and it went slower than I hoped. You know, we would go in and, and talk to sports about this, this stuff, and um, there was no action. There was an energy in the room and really good intention, like, oh, this is very interesting. Yeah, we haven't really thought about this. And then everyone would go off and just do the same thing. So it, it took a while to start sort of changing the course of this big ship, if you like. Um, but as I was doing this work, I I knew that the elite athletes were actually very privileged. They already had nutritionists and physios and strength and conditioning coaches to help them. And just layers outside of that, right down to girls, you know, who were dropping out of sport at twice the rate of boys. We have, you know, sort of a bit of a crisis, inactivity crisis in this country, certainly with girls, um, that there was a need for this understanding, this education, this knowledge about what is it that we need to do to support female athletes and females 
in terms of their health and their fitness and their training and and um what like what 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 do we need to do because there was really very little information out there so that's why we set up the well hq um which is really designed to sort of change that to change the amount of information and credible resources that we have to help us support girls and women better in sport yeah thank you for sharing i i'm just fascinated at you know hearing about some of this journey that you've been on and i think you know many can relate who have been trying to make change in certain areas, um, you know, and topics could range, right? When you're in big institutions, unfortunately, sometimes those things happen very slowly and frustrating. And it sounds like, you know, you've really taken initiative, um, which um, with the Well HQ to provide this education, which I think is so important. And that's why I'm really excited to have you on the show today, because we do need to do better. And even from myself being a male, right? I know I need to do better. And I'm really looking forward to hearing about like how I can be a better coach for my female athletes, um, a better father for my daughters. I have two teenage uh, daughters and, you know, I have a wife that I support who is a runner and an athlete herself. So um, I'm really excited um, to hear and learn a little bit more how we can provide that support. Um, Now, you yourself as a athlete like have you run in the past or have you ever been a runner what's what's your running background yeah yeah so um I was a games player right through university and left university I was actually a rugby player in university and I was at a university where where the rugby team were very successful and we won you know the university um, league, and it was amazing. And I and I we played at Twickenham, which for in England is like the hallowed turf of rugby, and it was incredible. And then I kind of finished university, and I thought I'm either going to have to you know take a step up and and continue to try and compete at this level in rugby, which were, at that time was a rapidly changing game in in the women's game, and women were getting bigger and stronger and faster, and it was getting more painful. Or I thought, or I could just hang up my boots now and say that I did it really well and not have to. <laughs> take that journey into what I felt like would be a painful a painful place so I um hung up my boots and then I just kind of um fell into running through a, a charity uh, I got a charity place in the London Marathon and I started and I just kind of you know classic fell fell in love with with running and I found actually running and long distance running really kind of was was something that I love to do as much for the mental challenge as as a physical challenge so I started running marathons then I moved to ultra endurance and I did things like the south um the south downs way run which was 100 kilometers along the south downs near us um really a great on trail running um and and then I got into uh triathlon and then I got into Ironman triathlon and I did a I did the uh, New Zealand Ironman um uh when I was 30 and so that was really the pinnacle. <laughs> like I kind of reached that pinnacle. I did a few more marathons, um, the Beachy Head Marathon, again, a brilliant trail marathon and just loved it and was OK. You know, I was never I was never winning, but I was always I always, you know, d- did. I really was pleased with how I was able to progress personally. And then I had children and, you know, the classic um, I didn't have time or the inclination to run for a while. Uh, I lost my mojo a bit. I had to redefine my relationship with running. Um, I was always running towards something in the past. You know, I was running towards a goal and the goal was was big and it was a marathon or it was an Ironman. And my training was always pushing me to get fitter and better all the time. And when kids came along and I had to balance children and my changing body and uh, work, and um, I I kind of couldn't figure out how to do it for a while because I couldn't figure out that if I could only do a 20 minute run, that was that was like that was okay because I'd be like, well, that's nothing, you know, and I just had to reframe. And it took, you know, I, I. it took a long time for me to enjoy running again because I felt like I was failing myself all the time by not pushing for those big goals. But actually, you know, it it took a few years, but uh, I love running now for the pure joy of running. And um, whether I can go out for 10 minutes or an hour um, and whether I walk it or I run walk it, um, I adore it. And, you know, it's my space. It's my brain space. It's my mindfulness. It's uh, all of those things, as well as my sort of um, for my physical health. So um, my relationship with running has shifted over time, but it's still, you know, really important part of my life if I can stay in one piece. 
<laughs> um, well, thank you for sharing that because I know there are many, many, um, you know, the majority of our listeners are, you know, women and, you know, there's going to be a lot of our listeners who resonate with your story. And, you know, a lot of the athletes in our coaching program come from an athletic background, you know, like yourself. And then, yes, you go through these changes, right? Especially as you become a mom and after children. And that's why it, I think, you know, you're such in a great position to speak, not only from the science side of things, right. And what we're going to get into, but also you've, you've lived it, right. You've had that personal experience as an athlete. You've had that personal experience as a female with a changing body. And, you know, you're in this place now where you are able to enjoy the many benefits that running offers um, from an exercise perspective and yeah, about staying healthy. You know, we have a bunch of episodes on how you can do that. So you're going to have to check out some of those. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's get into today's uh, topic, if that's okay with you. When it does come to running, you know, where are men and women different? I have some really good discussions about sex differences in terms of sport, because on one hand, it's really important. And on the other hand, it really doesn't matter because in sport, we tend to compete either with ourselves or with, you know, in, in groups that are defined by our sex. So actually, it doesn't matter that that men are different. But but actually, fundamentally, it kind of re is really important to understand because and the, the reason it's really important to understand why we're different is because so much of the research and what we know about health, performance, training, adaptation is based on research in the male body. Um, and, and the way sport has been designed, whether that's um, kit, equipment, you know, shoes and boots, all of those things, again, have been designed with the um, research mostly done on the male body. So we did we published a paper a couple of years ago, which looked at sport and exercise science uh, research that's published in the top five journals looking at um, sports performance and um, only six percent of it was done exclusively on female groups um, so um, a large proportion of it was done own exclusively on the male body and some was done on mixed groups but they didn't take into account sex differences um, so we are very poorly served in terms of of anyone's understanding of what's going on in a woman's body when they're trying to train for health or fitness or performance so actually understanding the difference is kind of important because it allows us to say where are the assumptions okay to make in terms of what we know about how to train you know this sort of default male and where are the assumptions pretty flawed um which I have to say is in most places you know we, we probably need to do better investigation revisit you know our investigation of the human body and check that what the principles that hold true for the male body actually hold true for the female body. Um, so fundamentally, we, we all know the obvious differences. You know, as you look at as a female, we, are, we tend to be smaller and lighter. So about 10 to 15 percent shorter in height on average uh, and lighter. We have um, often have shorter limb length. We have shorter foot length. Um, in terms of running and being kind of like an endurance runner, we have a smaller heart. We have a smaller lung capacity by about 25 percent. We have a smaller cardiac output. We have less hemoglobin in our blood, which means that we carry less oxygen, which means that if you think about all those things combined, we have a lower VO2 max or aerobic capacity than men. So on average, our VO2 max as a woman will be lower than that of, of a man. However, what's quite cool is within, within that, um, we know, for example, that when you're running a marathon, your ability to run efficiently is quite an important determinant of performance. You know, like how much energy you use at any given running pace is really important. And we know that elite women, you know, well-trained women could run a marathon distance at about 80% of their VO2 max, and they can, and they can achieve that intensity. So if, if a woman finds a, a guy who has the same VO2 max as, as them, which is totally plausible um, because there's quite a big overlap in the natural distribution of aerobic capacity between men and women. If you find a guy who's got the same VO2 max, you can totally race him like and uh, across something like a marathon or, a, you know, like a slightly longer distance race and expect to be able to fully compete, which is is quite cool. But um, in terms of, you know, the shorter distances of running as it gets shorter and the determinants of performance are more based on strength or power or speed. That's where obviously the female body is, is just it has less capacity. Um, and, and that kind of is rooted in off. So that's kind of to do with 
obviously we have different anatomy, we have different biomechanics, um, and we have different shapes and sizes, and then we have different physiology, and then layer that on in terms of our evolutionary responsibility in, in the human species, which for w- women is to reproduce, um, we then layer in that physiology, which is about having a menstrual cycle and having um, sex hormones, which influence from our brain to our bones to our cardiovascular system to our immune function you know, these hormones are widely influential and so we have a ton of these two female sex hormones and a little bit of the male what we might call the male hormone testosterone and men have you know a ton of testosterone and very little estrogen and and so that difference in hormonal physiology creates huge differences and I guess when it comes to sport well, human beings are, are hardwired to survive, right? So um, everything we do, and particularly our hormonal reactions, you know, like when we have the fight or flight response, we have adrenaline and cortisol and things change in our bodies to help us either run very fast or like be confident enough to go and fight whatever's, whatever the threat is. Um, so we are hardwired for survival and our physiology really helps us with that. And with females, we're hardwired to uh, A, survive and B, reproduce. And sometimes those things cannot exist um, like in a symbiotic relationship. So, for example, if we wanted to compete with men in sport and we wanted to become as fit as we could be as women, um, we would probably compromise our ability to reproduce. And we can talk about that in a minute when we talk about, you know, um, some of the very female specific factors to do with um, the menstrual cycle and, and health. But um our our female body is kind of designed to make sure that we can survive and if we got pregnant we can survive and if if we can't do that then the first thing that goes is our ability to reproduce so it's really interesting to think of kind of like not just how we're built and not just how our insides are working but how our our sort of roles in this in this human race um influence how our bodies work and how that might then have an f- impact on how our bodies respond to different trainings, to different nutrition, to different energy states. Um, So it's kind of like it's it's big, right? It's a big area. Um, We're fundamentally different, um, but there are some real cool nuances to do with female physiology that we can get stuck into. Yeah. And thank you for highlighting some of those, you know, differences um, in terms of anatomy, hormones, biomechanics, like you said. So is success you know, in running defined by some of these, you know, differences or your biological sex? I think depending on what we mean by success. So if success in, if success in sport is, you know, in running is faster, then yes, you know, you uh, men will on average be faster than women. Um, the longer the distance gets, as we know, the, the sort of almost the, the closer the gap gets. And we know that there are ultra distance races where women have won outright. Um, but if you took the best, the, the most fit man and the most fit woman in any domain, whether you're talking like short, you know, distance, the, the man would would come out on top. Um, but whether that's success or not is, is, you know, kind of, I guess, um, arbitrary, because like I say, some, you know, women are often competing against women uh, or the competing against themselves. Um, and success might be staying injury free and, you know, De- developing and adapting and progressing and if that's the case then no that's not defined by our biological sex it's totally influenced by it and there are different influences to staying healthy injury free illness free and being able to progress and develop and and you know pb uh, as and when you need to um and if that's success then it's not defined by biological sex but it is influenced by it yeah no that's a great segue because i do want to learn a little bit more about the, you know, specifics to like running and training and, you know, what are some of those differences um, with respect to female and male runners um, when it comes to like recovery, training, um, you know, any adaptations that we need for training or injury risk? Yeah, so I I think one of the topics we talk a lot about when we're we're educating is the menstrual cycle. So it's really the defining rhythm of a a female's body. and that in itself throws up influences on all of the things that you've just described, training, adaptation, motivation to train, um, recovery, injury, um, mood, uh, illness. So so in that respect, even understanding that is, is a huge step forward if we're trying to think about 
um, what the differences might be. So to give you some examples, across our menstrual cycle, estrogen, there's two hormones, estrogen and progesterone. That There are other hormones, but these those are kind of the two main players. And estrogen in the first half of the cycle kind of goes from very low to its peak. And that is the like the influential hormone is estrogen. And estrogen is an amazing hormone. It um, is an anabolic hormone. So much like testosterone, it can kind of help with muscle repair, uh, growth and adaptation. Estrogen has a knock on effect to growth hormone. So it creates this very kind of anabolic environment in our body, which is really helpful when you're training and trying to adapt. And so there has been some research about recovery when your estrogen levels are are higher and that your recovery is more robust. And what that means is that it might be quicker. You might have less muscle soreness or the muscle soreness might diminish more quickly. Um, And you might have less biochemical markers of of fatigue and damage. So in that way, you know, suddenly we've got um, a, a hormonal environment, which on in some times of our cycle is kind of more on our side when it comes to recovering and adapting. And I guess when we think about the menstrual cycle, it's not about saying, oh, well, that's a shame because if I'm going to do stuff over here where my hormones don't do that, then that's bad luck. It's not about that. It's saying if we understand our cycle and know when to kind of, you know, pull and push some of these levers as athletes, particularly as individual athletes where we are slightly more in control of what we're doing, how we're training, when we're recovering, when we're doing the high intensity sessions and the fartleks and when we're doing the low intensity steady state stuff. If we have you know, flexibility around that, trying to tune that into how you feel across your cycle and how your physiology is kind of helping is on your side. So we know in the second half of the cycle, when progesterone arrives on the scene and um, is one of the influential hormones, that we are kind of better able to use fat as a fuel. And so therefore, those longer, longer endurance runs, for example, might feel better, you might um, perform better, um because of just how your metabolism is working um we know for example that uh estrogen influences the collagen in our joints and so some of the physiotherapy literature shows that our joints become slightly looser um when our estrogen is high now some people have related that to injury and we don't actually have very robust evidence to say you know like if, if you're in this phase of your cycle you're going to get an acl injury but what we have got, you know, some evidence and particularly feedback from athletes is that there are times of the cycle when you might have tighter hamstrings, when you might have the back niggle that flares up. And it's understanding that is cyclical. And then either, you know, if you're working with a physio, getting them to help with strategies around that time or, or just knowing that the underlying cause isn't musculoskeletal injury, it's a slight looseness in your pelvis that in time is going to correct so what can we do around now to sort of navigate through um so there are some cool things I say cool because I think knowing is just so empowering and it's not about saying oh gosh isn't it annoying when I have premenstrual symptoms that make me feel like I don't I'm not motivated to train which we know lots of women do there was a there's a great study of 14,000 uh uses of Strava female users of Strava and um, they answered lots of questions around their menstrual cycle and 88% of them said they had cycle symptoms which impacted their ability to train Um, whether it was the quality of training whether it was enjoyment of training whether it was even showing up to training and again that's important for us to understand but it shouldn't be seen as kind of like a weakness it should be seen as an opportunity to say are we going to put up with debilitating period pain or um, bloating or um, lethargy Or are we going to say if this happens every month and it impacts my ability to do my sport or enjoy my running, shall like shall we try and do something about it? So, uh, Dwayne, I can't actually remember what your question was, but (laughs) we've we've, we've meandered through some cool stuff. There was so much uh, gold there that you shared, and just um, coming from the physio perspective, I can you know share throughout my career how many you know, females that I've seen, like the common kind of injury I'll put in kind of air quotes here is like sacroiliac joint pain. So SI joint pain. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed, you know, those patients over time who have, you know, it is in that cycle, right? It is kind of once a month, they start having that pain on one side in their lower back area. And a lot of times patients who have instability, inherent ligament dyslaxity already. And then you have this, Mm -hmm. you know, spike in hormones 
they could get some malalignment of their SI joint or get some SI joint pain. And you kind of, you know, you go to a physio, you go to a chiropractor and you get kind of corrected, right? They put it back in place. But the key for those folks who, you know, constantly get those symptoms is stability and stabilization, right? And like, you know, learning how to actually activate the muscles around the pelvic floor. I know you guys have some great content in pelvic floor, um, you know, stabilization and motor control. Um, is so I, I definitely related kind of yeah. back to my physio treating days um, when you were yeah. talking about that because that's yeah. something you know we as physios commonly see in the clinic. Um, but and it's really I, interesting when sorry to, to no, just no. on that point because I think it's really interesting when we were working in, with the elite athletes and people were sort of like oh you know should we you know, at different times of the cycle, should we, be, should we be concerned about doing speed and agility or plyometrics? You know, should we be sort of, I would say, protecting the athletes? And actually the physio's um, perspective was if we make really resilient athletes and if we work on that stability, mobility, um, then layering on peaks of hormones is going to be okay. Um, and actually we can't, you know, let's, let's not sort of get over anxious about these few days let's create a, an athlete who for all time uh, is able to cope with whether it's a spike in hormones or whether it's an unexpected change in direction or or you know uh, uneven ground and uh, let's create that and and I think that's as, as a really good philosophy and, and as females I don't know whether this is something you're really familiar with but we tend to be really um kind of poor biomechanically sometimes and there are so many reasons why that is um we there is a gender play gap from so from the you know from five we are playing differently as girls and boys and that can influence um how well we learn to move in lots of different ways and so being kind of stable and mobile being robust enough to be able to cope with you know uneven ground or our body in a weird position like that that comes from wrestling with your friends or like you know climbing up trees and trying to not fall out and often boys and it sounds cliche but the research reflects that that's what happens and the girls are you know they might be singing and they might be um like doing some dancing but they're not really doing this like really um chaotic movement which helps us develop resilience and then there's some other research which shows that we as females preferentially activate our quadriceps so we over rely on them and then we get weakness in our glutes and our hamstrings and I'm sure that's something as a physio you constantly work on with people I know oh, that's yeah. something I have to <laughs> constantly work on uh, and then you mentioned pelvic floor and we see such a range of pelvic floor issues in females so from and particularly in athletes um hypertonic so kind of overactive pelvic floor through to postnatal women trying to return to running who find they're leaking and they have weakness in their pelvic floor and even understanding that there is a, there are is a difference in in the dysfunction that can happen in pelvic floor that where the symptoms can often be the same, whether that's leaking urine, whether that's um, recurrent urinary tract infections, an inability to empty our bowels, so constipation, like loads of different consequences of pelvic floor dysfunction. But it can range, and and in, and some of the athletes we work with, it's definitely that inability to relax the pelvic floor fully that is the problem. Whereas in some of the postnatal women or some of the perimenopausal women, it's either a weakness in the pelvic floor or in perimenopausal women, when our hormones are declining, it's actually a sort of atrophy of, of um, the vaginal walls. And with, so then that's not providing stability, sort of a um, structure or scaffolding for the pelvic floor. So a range of things that can go wrong specifically in a female anatomy and actually we tend to just clump it together and say it's urinary stress incontinence it's probably a weak pelvic floor and we kind of just and then you've got all these women doing sort of doing their pelvic floor exercises probably doing them wrong um, right. not but actually some of them who are really fit and have a hypertonic pelvic floor are actually just strengthening something that's already kind of too uh, like not able to relax enough so it's fascinating isn't it like taking all of these parts of of things that are specifically influenced by either the female biomechanics, like how our, you know, hips are wider or, or our neuromuscular system, how we activate, um, or our physiology and how the hormones influence those things. When you, you suddenly build up a picture. So when you go back to my first question, which was, do we support our, our female athletes as well as we can? If you're not taking into account all of those things and using them in your problem solving, when let's say you're a physio or you're a coach, then the answer cannot be yes. It, you know, it has to be like, oh, no, we haven't really taken apart this jigsaw of what it means to be a female 
and put it back together and really considered all the important pieces. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And I think, I guess, from what I'm hearing is, you know, we need to think about what are the differences, but at the same time, not say that's going to limit our abilities, right? So how can women, you know, really tap into their strength and manage like those unique challenges that they face? I know you mentioned, you know, thinking about, you know, what, you know, where am I in my cycle? And is that going to change some of my training and like putting on my coach's hat, I was thinking about like, yes, when I have a female athlete who does her first, like really long run in marathon training, like a 16 miler or an 18 miler. And it just felt horrible. Like now I'm thinking about going back. It's like, Hmm, you know, maybe if I had that conversation, uh, with her, like at, you know, what point of the cycle, you know, is that why she felt really terrible or was it the weather? Was it because, you know, we didn't, get good sleep during this week. Um, but so I, I think you've given me something to think about in terms of, you know, why women may feel the way they do uh, during that month. But, you know, how can women like tap into that strength and, and manage some of these unique challenges? I love what you just said there, because you didn't kind of go to the place that some people go, which is, oh, my gosh, it must be the menstrual cycle. Like, this is about, um, giving you loads of tools for problem solving as a coach for example like you're always trying to work out why was that hard or why was that good and the menstrual cycle has to be one of the factors and often gets forgotten um but it's not it's not only going it's not going to be the only factor and it might be a factor that's influencing something else so you know sleep might be impacted by being in the perimenopause and that's not just a case of saying get better sleep like we have to get to get i kind of have to like look at the bigger picture here um but I think when it comes to tapping into our strength, I think understanding our bodies is a hugely underutilized power for women because we have been sort of deprived of information. Um, over here in the UK, we, we've had a big um, surge in discussion around the menopause. And I don't know whether that's coming across to, to your side of the pond. But um, the reason that started happening was because we had a, a celebrity who did this brilliant documentary about the menopause um, and about how it affects our bodies and what we can do about that. And there was a whole generation of 14, 50 year old women who for the first time in their life heard information from a celebrity. Now she did it brilliantly because she worked with a doctor and really good information. But I was like, how could we have got to a generation of midlife women? And the first time we hear about our bodies and what's happening to them is from this person who was, is on TV, you know? So we are very, poorly educated right from you know day dot in terms of understanding our body so that's for me is how we tap into our strength and the way we tap into that strength is yes it's kind of absorbing information like this but it's also listening to our bodies and again in this in this society now we we spend far less time just taking a moment to listen to what our body is trying to tell us and the only time we listen to it is when it's screaming at us um and we are often much much more comfortable with kind of silencing it and trying to ignore it or just do more to try and drown it out than actually listening to it. So I think listening to our bodies is, is a real superpower because one example of listening to our bodies is to track our menstrual cycle and to A, understand what it looks and feels like for us because every woman's cycle is different. And my experience of my cycle will be different from the next person's in terms of our sort of lived experience. Um, and lots of the research that's coming out now is not just about reporting what are the most common symptoms and um, what's the average length of a cycle, but it's like, what is the psychological experience of our cycle? And that appears to be the determining factor about how we behave. So, you know, whether it's a motivation to move or to train, whether it's, um, you know, whether we want to be social or take risks or um, be really productive and work or feel like we we want to you know be in a dark room with you know a book our behavior is is hugely influenced across our cycle and and that will be different for lots of people so understanding your experience of your cycle for me is a superpower because if you understand it you know what's going to happen across your cycle you can start to um anticipate stuff so you can anticipate those good weeks you know there are there are parts of our cycle where the hormones will just make us feel kind of invincible, you know, social, motivated, energized, we recover well, we perform well. And on those days, I can guarantee women aren't going, 
oh, like this is my menstrual cycle. This is amazing. It's the days when we feel tearful and tired and bloated and we go, our period's coming tomorrow. My menstrual cycle is so awful. But actually just really understanding our whole cycle and knowing that across time, we're going to be getting some brilliant stuff from it. And we're going to be getting some stuff that we don't like. And then we're at choice whether to do something about it. And again, there is no golden bullet here. There's no like, no one's invented the thing that goes, well, if you have premenstrual symptoms, here you go. But we do have more information now about, you know, nutrition and diet, um, lifestyle, sleep, stress management, exercise, right through to medical interventions that can help with those things. Um, So when you understand and listen to your body across your cycle, you are then at choice to be quite resilient to what it throws at you. um, And you can make the most of the good bits uh, and be like, I know that I feel great in that week. So, yeah, why don't I plan some of those good sessions then or I know that I actually do prefer going steady and I and I just feel good doing that here so where possible let me do that then and it's not about saying well actually that no that's annoying because my marathon is going to fall on that day if you've been doing that for the months leading up to your marathon you've been getting all of the the extra adaptation and extra motivation and um, confidence from training in that way that it doesn't matter when your marathon you know, shows up um, in terms of your cycle because you put in all the work beforehand. So for me, listening to our body and understanding our body is is a, is a real strength. Second of all is making sure that we are in the right kit for our female body and making sure we haven't just kind of settled on something. So the two big things for me, well, the first big thing is breast support. And um, we've done some brilliant projects around breast support, but what's overwhelming for me is how little information again we get as girls when our breasts are developing and then as women we might get a fit we might sort of find roughly find our size and then just that's it for the rest of our lives and I know I know most women have sports bras in their drawer that they're like yeah they don't fit they were really expensive though so I'm not going to throw them away I'm going to keep them but I can't wear them because they don't fit well why don't they fit because I thought they fit and then I moved and they and they didn't feel great and we don't get that right very often but we need to, the bra is such an important part of kits. There's a great research group I work with um, down on the South Coast called the University of Portsmouth Breast Research Group. And they study breast biomechanics. And they, so they study how the breasts move, particularly during running, because it's quite a high impact sport. And they've collected lots of data. And they show that when our breasts are moving, so when they're poorly supported, so you're either wearing a, a really rubbish bra, you're not wearing a sports bra, but you're wearing like a bralette or a everyday bra. When your breasts are moving, um, it causes so many different changes in your biomechanics, um, even in the energetic. So you activate more muscles to counteract the breast movement. So you use more energy. Your upper body tilts forward to counteract the breast movement. So you become less economical in your movement. Your stride length shortens, so you cover less distance. And all of those things mean that if you start a marathon in a brilliant bra, which is high support and well-fitting, and you're lined up next to a clone of yourself who is wearing poor breast support, um, you will finish a mile ahead of her just because you had good breast support. So we're talking, you know, important, important factors when it comes to running and performance. But also we know that lots of women suffer breast pain. Uh, Lots of women have bras that rub and cause the blisters around the rib cage. And these are all not okay. And a good a good sports bra is going to really fix that. So listen to your body, get the right kit. Um, be as well informed about your life stages as you can be. I think, again, we go through some inevitable, some by choice life stages, whether that's starting our periods and our bodies changing shape or going through pregnancy and postnatal or going through the menopause. And actually stuff is happening to our physiology that's going to affect our ability to run, our motivation to run. Um, and it doesn't have to hold us back but we do have to be aware of it. So cycling back to the first bit, if we understand our body and we know what's normal for us, we can start to see when things change and we can start to then go and advocate for our own, our own help and support. Um, so those are my three, three things. Uh, listen to your body, get the right kit, particularly the right sports bra and really understand your body as it transitions through life stages. Oh, that's great. And I'm just fascinated with, you know, like you're educating me. This is amazing because I've never thought about breast support. I knew it was important. I knew that it's a problem in a lot of women and who struggle with finding the right sports bra for running, but I never looked at it from the lens of like, 
my physio running form gait analysis lens of like, hey, like I'm analyzing my athletes' gait patterns all the time. And when their elbows are slightly out and they're running like, you know, chicken wings, I'm having them bring them in because it's going to be more efficient for them running. And I never thought of thinking about breast support as being like, hey, this is going to be a hindrance where you're going to actually expend more energy because you're not supported, right, while you're running. And so thank you for like, bringing that <laughs> light bulb moment um, in my brain. I'm like, yeah, that makes sense from like a biomechanical energy conservation standpoint that you will be more efficient as a runner um, if you are supported. So all, all great, great uh, information here. And, you know, you mentioned menopause and if you can, because we do have like literally the majority of folks listening to this, as I mentioned, are going to be female and the majority are going to be in their forties and fifties. And, you know, that, and they come here because, um, a lot of them do wind up getting injured at that time. And whether it is, you know, training errors, getting back into running after taking a long time off. Um, but what are the unique, like, challenges of menopause as it relates to running? And I've, you know, learned some of the content on your page about like, perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause. Can you just, I know it's such a, you could probably go in depth for like an hour on this topic, but you know, what can you share with our listeners that is going to be helpful for them in kind of a, a shorter bit amount of time, if you can do that? Yeah, of course. <laughs> well, you know, it's challenged me. Um, so, um, in our forties, our menstrual cycle goes from being fairly predictable and fairly kind of rhythmic to starting to actually be a little bit chaotic. And so the first thing that happens when we enter perimenopause is that we have big spikes of hormones and then big drops of hormones. And that's, you know, if you think about the menstrual cycle causing some good stuff and some bad stuff, that's almost amplified in the perimenopause. Um, and we can really feel the effects of that. And that's when we start experiencing symptoms. But often, because we're in midlife and we're busy women who are trying to fit in, you know, running and family and caregiving and work, we we often overlook some of those symptoms. So knowing kind of knowing that, that those might be related to perimenopause is kind of important. And as we move through our 40s into our early 50s, we have sort of on in the background of those fluctuating hormones, we have declining absolute levels. And because basically when we get to the perimenopause, sorry, the menopause, our estrogen, our progesterone stop being produced. Um, and so there, there are so all sorts of and changes. This is a silly question. Uh, so then the cycle stops. The cycle stops, point, yeah. Here's, okay, all right. So Thank what you. happens is the cycle, for all the men yes, out there. <laughs> yes, the cycle in the first place kind of gets shorter and then gets kind of irregular. And then menopause is actually defined as a year after your last period. So you have to kind of go a year without having a cycle and a period to then say, I am menopausal. And that's when your body will not be producing its own estrogen or progesterone. Um, and so it's some people call it um, kind of you're in hormone deficiency because we need those hormones to be healthy. And they are related to some of the changes we see for runners. So estrogen is really important for building and maintaining bone strength. And, you know, notoriously, we um, we lose that as we lose our estrogen and we have osteoporosis in a, in a higher prevalence of women as we lose that estrogen. Um, estrogen is really important for muscle health and muscle mass. And so um, that starts to decline because our body is not helping us keep it. And so we have to do so almost extra work to, to, to keep our body, as we've said, robust, really resilient and stable. So, some of the things that really need to happen in midlife, which we probably have ignored in our younger years, is um, weight training and conditioning. So as runners, we're probably notoriously bad and think weight training is a waste of time. If I could be running, why am I not running? Um, but actually, if we are going to be losing muscle mass and bone strength, one of the best things to do for that is to build in some strength and conditioning. So like, we, we need to try and find a way that we can you know, build into our, and we love, like, if, if it's if it's a challenge for us we're not going to do it so but we need to build it in and we notoriously don't do that well enough we need to start warming up more again gone are the days where we could probably just go out for 10k and like you know hit our race pace within the first couple of minutes and be fine you know we need to warm up more um and that like that's okay but like knowing that and knowing that we need to do um a little bit more work ahead of actually your main training session um we need to make sure we are 
looking at our nutrition, weight gain and weight changes and body composition changes are really common in perimenopause and menopause. Um, Actually, as your estrogen declines, we become slightly more male-like in terms of our physiology, and we start to deposit fat in a similar way to males. So if you think about females, we we deposit fat around our hips and our bottom, Mm. um, and that's how we get our kind of more female shape. As we lose our estrogen, we start to deposit fat in our tummy, um, which is a more male way to deposit fat. So lots of women uh, find they change shape. They might change body composition. And it's it's actually, unfortunately, a natural part of this changing hormonal environment. So thinking about, you know, including weight training, will it help? Will help because it increases, you know, it's, it's an extra load, energetic load for your body to cope with. So that's good for weight management. Um, but also thinking about your hydration and your nutrition and making sure that's, you know, as good as it can be. Um, making sure you're eating consciously. So lots of midlife women eating on the go, grabbing and going and actually eating consciously can really help. Um, protein is super important as we age. And so making sure we're getting protein. And if we're following a vegan or vegetarian diet, making sure that we are being really vigilant about that because we, it's not as easy to get our needs from those diets. Um, and addressing symptoms, it would be my final, um, tip there is that don't put up with them because there are things that you can do and there are resources you can, you know, access, but there's also healthcare practitioners who specialize in the menopause who can help. And it's not, it's not a weakness to say I'm going through the perimenopause or menopause, because if you get the help, it can be life changing for women. You know, we've, we've met women who have stopped training, have left work, have left relationships, but they've suddenly accepted that actually this is normal and I need to get some help and they've got some help and life has changed around so um it's a really um challenging time sometimes for women who have been absolutely accomplished and been able to do anything they want to do without even questioning whether that's racing whether that's working and now is the time when you might have to be slightly more you know um there's some challenges to to being able to do what you want to do but there's also a mindset shift which is like (laughs) um you kind of lose the the need to kind of please people impress people and you just you know step into your own power and understand your own body uh, and make sure it's working for you yeah self-care right and and tap into that and and be aware and I love how you shared the you know benefits of definitely weight training strength training for runners uh warming up because uh, many folks who've been listening to this podcast have heard it through kind of an injury prevention lens and performance lens but you know hearing it from you coming from the you know middle-aged female lens and why it is even more important for you if you are you know a mother runner in your 40s or 50s um hopefully if those haven't implemented yet will actually take action and implement because it can help them um from you know a biological standpoint of what their bodies are going through during this period and from what i've been gathering it sounds like most females don't realize they're in perimenopause like how long does that usually range like how many months or years it can rain it can last up to 10 years so it's, that's wow. not good news for people who are in it. But um, and that's, you know, that's an extreme. So, um, you know, women might experience, experience one year of symptoms. They might experience up to 10 years. Um, 30% of women will experience some symptoms, but they will be completely manageable. 30% of women will actually probably kind of sail through and not really, you know, notice too many changes. And 30% of women will be flawed. All right. So last topic that I would love to talk about, as I mentioned, I'm a father of two teenage daughters who are athletes and um, they do kind of high performance volleyball. And, you know, how can we as you know, most of the people listening to this again are probably going to be parents. Um, How can we as like parents or coaches or educators, right, if you're a teacher, um, how can we support our adolescent female athletes um, and runners a little bit better? So we do a lot of work with um, teenage girls in um, and particularly sporty teenage girls. And um, one of the things we try and do is get them to open up about their bodies because their bodies are changing. You know, they go through huge changes during puberty uh, and it's a it's a hugely vulnerable time. They start their periods. They change body shape. They develop breasts. Their brains are changing. Emotionally, they're changing. Socially, things are changing. And um, 
creating spaces where the girls can ask questions about that is so important. And in sport, we have tended to look at puberty, particularly in sports, you know, like gymnastics and um, dance, where changing bodies are sometimes challenging. So we've tended to not want to open up the conversation about puberty or periods or, or bodies. And actually, that's so important because the girls all have so many important questions that we need to help them with. And we need to accept that their bodies are changing um, and they might change shape. They might, ch- they'll obviously be growing. Um, and sometimes in girls, that can mean their performance plateaus. Um, in boys, they, you know, the arrival of testosterone means they get sort of bigger and stronger. And for girls, the arrival of their hormones means they start to redistribute their fat, you know, again, around their hips and their bottom. They develop breast tissue um, as they grow they might become slightly less coordinated. And actually that can have an impact on something like running times for a small moment. And it's about almost nurturing them through that time because I've worked with, we've worked with a lot of young triathletes and they say, you know, I used to be winning and and now everyone's beating me. And it's like just saying, just hang on in there. Let's just work together. Let's stay consistent. Let's stay positive. Um, because actually they come out the other side, you know, half a season later, they're back you know they're back they're the the front of the pack um but in that time their body was changing it just they just had to you know hold fire and people panic in that in that time coaches panic um athletes panic and they say maybe I'm not made for running anymore and actually it's about being patient and nurturing which is really hard in sport particularly with young kids because you're like they want to do it we want them to do it um we also need to make sure that, that the value we put on what their body looks like um doesn't cause significant damage to them and what I mean is you know I've I've had loads of girls who will say to me my gymnastics coach said I can see your breakfast or my running coach said to me lighter is faster lighter is faster and then they said let's get on the scales and all of those mantras and those values um, and those words instilling girls the idea that they have to be as lean as they can be to be good at their sport. Now, there's no, you know, I'm not denying the fact that leanness and lightness is is important in some sports, but not at the expense of health. So we see so many girls who are under eating. And when they're training a lot, what happens is, um, you know, I said at the very beginning that their ability, you know, our reproductive ability is the first thing that will be compromised in a female body. So when we don't fuel our training effectively, whether we're a teenage girl or, you know, you know, middle-aged woman, we, we create this energy deficit. It's called relative energy deficiency in sport. And the consequences of that aren't just that our body says, well, you know what, to save energy, I'm going to shut down my reproductive cycle because, you know, I can still survive without a reproductive cycle and I will save energy. And so then, you know, w- girls will either stop having periods, they won't start their periods, they'll start having very irregular periods. But it goes much deeper than that, because those hormones of the cycle are so important for growth and development, for brain health, for breast health, for cardiovascular health, for immune function, that we now know so much about what happens when girls and women under fuel, under eat and their training. Um, and it affects um uh, psychological mental health, so 70% increased risk of depression, uh, affects bone health, increased risk of injury, immune function, increased risk of illness. It puts a ceiling on aerobic performance. It stops muscle adaptation. So suddenly, you know, like if, and and when they're young, this is when we can either plant the seeds of, of uh, empowerment and what a healthy body looks and feels like, or we can plant the seeds of lack of body confidence and, you know, this spiral of dysfunctional relationships with food. So for me, this is a key time to to talk about how bodies work, not how bodies look. And, you know, if an athlete has to be unhealthy to be light, then that's not the right sport or the right weight or the right um, weight category for them. Uh, and for me, there's like a no compromise. And, and um, we've seen um, ne- whole nations take a really strong approach on energy and energy deficit in sport. Um, and someone like Canada or New Zealand basically have said, you know, our female athlete work is making sure every athlete fuels effectively because we know the consequences in our female athletes of not doing that. And, you know, that they, they, they're teaching their girls to eat properly, to be heavier, to eat more and still perform brilliantly. So, and for me, this, this teenage time is, is really critical. So it's about accepting and supporting their changing body, encouraging them to talk about it and ask questions, and also being really careful about how we frame what bodies look like. 
Oh, yes. And coming from someone who has worked a lot in the gymnastics world in the beginning of my career, um, yeah, I just love everything that you had to say because there's still cultural things that need to change. Um, and I've seen the impact of so many young girls and, you know, that it's had on them. And, you know, we try as parents, right, to support our girls and really educate. And um, I just love everything that you had to say there. And hopefully, you know, I think we're making steps in the right direction, whether or not, you know, we're making steps in all places. I don't know if we are, but thank you for sharing that. That was extremely helpful. And yes, um, relative energy deficiency is huge and within our runners as well. And we have a whole episode on that topic that we've covered on, on the show and properly fueling. Um, so getting into our final stretch, the last question we asked all our guests here, if you can change one thing about the misconception about being a female runner, what would that be? I think what I'd love to change about being female in sport in terms of misconception is that there is fragility or weakness around the female body. I, I think the fragility is in the system that's been designed not to allow us to be educated or talk about or address some of some of the things that show up for us as women. Um, and by keeping us in the dark, we haven't learned enough about, you know, our amazing body and and what it can do. And And for me, it's all about opportunity. It's about framing these things not as fragility or weakness but as oh my gosh there's an opportunity to work with my body as a female that I didn't know before how amazing how amazing there's an opportunity to understand this life stage better so that I'm not flawed by it and I can actually continue to enjoy my sport so for me the misconception is that there are things about the female body that are annoying or weak or fragile and actually it's the system that is you know compromised and is fragile and if we create a system which empowers all women girls three to women you know well into their menopause about their bodies about what's happening about how to get the best out of them then everyone's going to feel like sport is a place that they belong so for me that's that's my wish yeah knowledge is power right and yeah once you know you know you can apply that knowledge and be able to work with your body um yeah so i'm sure there are so many runners who really resonated with your message and i can guarantee it pretty much um you know how can our healthy runner community connect with you so we have um, a website thewellhq.com um, on there, there is um, resources across all the topics, um, menstrual cycle, breast health, menopause, and we add topics all the time um, with, with new information. We have courses online if you're a physio or a, or a practitioner or a coach and you want to learn more in a sort of CPD way, we've got online courses. And finally, we have a book coming out in May 2023, um, which is like, well, you know, we essentially in terms of um, understanding your body better as an active woman. So we're really excited and we'll we'll let you know, Dwayne, and you can tell everyone um, when that's available in, in the spring next year. Yeah, please do. Uh, please do. There will definitely be many that would want to grab that book. So definitely let me know. I'll, you know, share it uh, within our communities. And, you know, guys who are listening to this, like I said, knowledge is power. And I'm sure you learned some things today. I learned some things today that I wasn't even expecting to learn today. Right. And, you know, the best way that we can help um, our female athletes is really sharing this. So wherever you're listening to this on the podcast or on the Spark Healthy Runner YouTube channel, you know, just click that little button, like copy link and just like send it to a friend um, who may need this, send it to a parent, send it to a coach, um, anyone who could just learn a little bit more um, because the more that we know, then the more change we can make, right? In society as a whole and really support um, our female runners, whether you are postmenopausal, uh, perimenopausal, or you're a young runner um, who's just starting out. So thank you so much, Dr. Emma. This has been like very, very educational. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate you taking your time out of your busy day and sharing your expertise on the show. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. All right. And as always, runners, let's maintain a strong mind, a strong body, and let's just keep on running. Until next time.